there, kids. Petey the Probability Pirate talking to you about permutations and probability. You know what a pirate's favorite letter is? You think it'd be R, but it's the C! <laughs> First vocabulary term is a permutation. That would be the arrangement of things in a certain order. So down here, you can see three examples involving permutations. First, we have books on a shelf. If you were to arrange books on a shelf in a particular order, that order that you arrange them in would be one permutation of those books. If you had a group of baseball players you wanted to arrange in a lineup, that would be a batting order from one through nine. Because it's in a specific order, the order that you arrange them in, in that lineup would be one permutation of those baseball players. And then if you choose letters for a password, so if you're creating a password, whatever password you make, the arrangement of those letters in the password would be one permutation of those given letters. Now a factorial would be the product of a given number and every natural number less than that, denoted by an exclamation mark. So this would be 4 factorial, this would be 7 factorial, this would be 0 factorial. So what this is saying is that if you are evaluating something like 4 factorial, what you're going to do is you're going to take 4 and multiply it by every natural number less than 4. And if you forgot what natural numbers are, natural numbers are counting numbers. They start at 1 and then go to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way till infinity. So if I'm evaluating 4 factorial, I'm going to multiply 4 by every natural counting number less than that. So it's going to be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which gives you 24. If I'm evaluating 7 factorial, I'm going to take 7 and multiply it by every natural number less than that, every counting number less than that. So 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, that's going to give you 5,040. That's what 7 factorial is equal to. Now, the only special case, the only one that doesn't obey the rules, would be 0 factorial. You just need to memorize that 0 factorial is equal to 1. Next, let's talk about probability. That would be the extent to which an event is likely to occur, measured by the ratio of the favorable outcomes to the whole number of possible outcomes. So again, probability is going to be the ratio of favorable outcomes to the whole number of possible outcomes. So what you're likely going to get when you find probability, it's going to be a fraction or a decimal, and it's going to be between 0 and 1. A 0 probability, meaning that this event is not going to occur, and a 1 probability, meaning that this event is definitely going to occur. Now, now there is something called percent probability and that's just where you take the ratio or the fraction that we were talking about and you multiply it by a hundred. So a probability of zero percent would mean the event would not occur and a probability of 100 percent would mean the event would definitely occur. But today we're just going to be dealing with the ratio of the favorable outcomes to the whole number of possible outcomes. So let's look at a couple examples. The first says what is the probability that you flip a coin and it lands on heads. So the proper notation for this would be the probability capital P of Heads, meaning what is the probability that you flip a coin and it lands on heads? And remember, probability is the ratio of the favorable outcomes to the whole number of outcomes possible. And when you flip a coin, there are only two outcomes possible. You can either get heads or you can get tails. So in our denominator, we're going to put a two. Now, in the numerator, how many favorable outcomes are there? Well, when you flip a coin and you want it to be heads, there's only one favorable outcome that it comes up heads. So we have one favorable outcome over two possible outcomes gives you a probability of one over two or one half. Now let's look at another example. So part B says, what is the probability you draw an ace of spades from a complete deck of cards? Again, the proper notation will be capital P and then parentheses and then what you want to find. So the ace of spades, you're trying to draw an ace of spades from a complete deck of cards. Well, that's going to be equal to, and remember, probability is the ratio of the favorable outcomes to the whole number of outcomes possible. Well, how many outcomes are possible? Well, in a complete deck of cards, there are 52 different cards. So there are 52 possible outcomes when you draw a card at random. And then how many favorable outcomes would there be? Well, there's only one ace of spades in the entire deck. So the probability that you draw that ace of spades from a complete deck of cards would be one favorable outcome to 52 possible outcomes, or one over 52. What's my favorite time of popcorn? Pirate's booty! Example time! <laughs> Now example one says evaluate each expression. So part eight, we're evaluating six factorial. And remember, a factorial just means you're gonna take whatever number you're taking the factorial of, and you're gonna multiply it by every natural number less than that, or every counting number less than that. So we're gonna take six and multiply it to five, and four, and three, and two, and one. And we get six factorial is equal to 720. Part B, we have 4 factorial. So again, a factorial just means you're going to take whatever number you're taking the factorial of, and you're going to multiply it by every natural number less than that number. So we're going to take 4 and multiply it by 3 and 2 and 1, and we end up getting 4 factorial is equal to 24. 
Part C, we have five factorial over three factorial. Okay, so in order to evaluate this ratio, this fraction right here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna expand the numerator and denominator. Remember, five factorial just means we're gonna take five and multiply it by every natural number less than that. So we're gonna take five, multiply it to four, three, two, and one. And then three factorial means we're gonna take three and multiply it to every natural number less than that. So it's gonna be three times two times one. Now you see in this fraction that we've created when we expanded the five factorial and the three factorial that the threes, the twos, and the ones all cancel out. Just leaving us with five times four in the numerator and then a one in the denominator when everything cancels out it's just going to be a one left over so five times four over one is going to be 20 over one or 20 and you're done for d we have zero factorial times three factorial so what we're going to do is we're going to expand each of these and multiply them together now remember zero factorial that's a special case we know zero factorial has to equal one then that's going to be multiplied to three factorial which again we're going to take three and multiply it to every natural number less than that so it's going to be three times two times one so if we take one and multiply it to three times two times one we end up getting that zero factorial times three factorial is equal to six why wasn't the pirate in class because he was playing hooky. Har, you try. Okay, doing the same thing here. Part eight, we have 10 factorial. So we're going to take 10 and multiply it by every natural number less than 10. So it's going to be 10 times nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. And we end up getting that 10 factorial is equal to 3,628,800. Part B, we have two factorial times three factorial. So we have to expand each of these and multiply them together. So two factorial just means we're going to take two and multiply by every natural number less than two, which is just one. So it's going to be two times one. Three factorial means we take three and multiply by every natural number less than three. So it's going to be three times two times one. So when we multiply this all out, we end up getting two factorial times three factorial is equal to 12. Part C, we have four times eight factorial. So what we need to do first is evaluate the factorial and then multiply that by four. So to evaluate eight factorial, we take eight and multiply by every natural number less than eight. So it's gonna be eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. Then we can multiply that by four. And we end up getting, when we evaluate this, four times eight factorial is 161,280. Part D, we have five factorial over four factorial times three factorial. So we're gonna expand each of these. Five factorial means we're gonna take five and multiply by every natural number less than five. So it's gonna be five times four times three times two times one. In the denominator, four factorial means we take four and multiply by every natural number less than four. And three factorial means we take three and multiply by every natural number less than three. Now, is there anything we can cancel out because we have a fraction here? Yeah, we have fours that cancel out, threes that cancel out, twos that cancel out, and ones that cancel out. In our numerator, the only thing left is a five in our denominator we have three times two times one so we know that five factorial over four factorial times three factorial is going to equal five over six now let's quickly review the counting principle so if there is some event that can occur in p different ways and another event that can occur in q different ways then to figure out how many different ways that both events can occur you just multiply p times q so for example, let's say you're creating a two letter password and you can only use the letters X, Y, and Z, but they can be used more than once. To figure out how many different two letter passwords you can create, you're just gonna take how many different letters you could use for that first letter in your password, that would be three different letters, X, Y, or Z, and multiply it to how many different letters you could use for that second letter in your password, which would be X, Y, or Z, that would be three different letters. So three times three, that's gonna give you nine possible two letter passwords you can form using the letters X, Y, and Z if the letters can be used more than once. Now example two says you meet someone for the first time who says their name is four letters long. Assuming the letters may be used more than once, what is the probability that you guess their name correctly on the first attempt? Let's assume that you don't know what this person's name is, and it could be A A A A or Z Z Z Z, something like that. Now remember, in this question, we're determining the probability that you guess their name correctly on the first attempt, and probability is the ratio of the favorable outcomes to the total number of outcomes possible. So we need to first figure out how many outcomes are possible. To figure out the total number of possible outcomes, we need to figure out the total number of possible four-letter names if letters can be used more than once. So there are four letters in this given name. How many different letters can be used for the first letter in our name? Well, there are 26 letters in the alphabet, so we're going to put 26 in that first spot. Now, in this question, it says letters can be used more than once, meaning if the first letter is A, the second letter could also be A, and the third letter could also be A, and the fourth letter could also be A. So because this first event doesn't affect any of the other events, this would be considered an independent event. Now, what that means here is that if there are 26 letters you could choose from for the first letter in the person's name, there are also 
26 different letters you can choose from for the second letter in the person's name and the third letter in the person's name and the fourth letter in the person's name. So to figure out the total number of possible outcomes, the total number of possible four letter names using all the letters in the alphabet and being allowed to use them more than once, the counting principle just says we take 26 and multiply it to 26 and multiply that to 26 and multiply that to 26. And we end up getting that there are 456,976 possible four letter names you can create, assuming that letters can be used more than once. Now, before you box this up and call it a day, you need to actually answer the question. It says, what is the probability that you guessed their name correctly on the first attempt? So remember, probability is the ratio of the favorable outcomes to the total number of possible outcomes. So in this question, we just figured out there are 456,976 possible names that you could choose using four letters, if letters are allowed to repeat. And you only get one guess. You only get one permutation of these given letters, meaning the probability that you guessed their name correctly on the first attempt would be one out of 456,976. Now, something kind of fun to note is that you could actually find in future math classes ways to increase this probability because you could factor in that people don't usually have a name where four letters repeat, meaning you likely don't know somebody whose name is A, 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 A or B, 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 B. So you could remove those from the total possible outcomes and increase your probability of guessing their name correctly on the first attempt. What's a pirate's favorite movie? The ones that are rated R, you try. Okay, this time it says on an iPhone, you choose a four number password. If the numbers are zero through nine and numbers can be used more than once, find the probability that someone could guess your password on the first attempt. So again, we are finding probability, meaning we are gonna create a ratio and it's gonna be the ratio of the favorable outcomes over the total number of possible outcomes. So the first thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna figure out how many total possible outcomes are there? How many total possible four number passwords can you create? Well, the way we can figure that out is we're gonna use the counting principle just like we were using. So there are four numbers in this given password. The first number, how many different numbers could you choose for that first number in your password? Well, the numbers are zero through nine. So there are 10 different numbers you could choose to be in that first number in your password. What about the second number in your password? Well, in this question, it says you can use numbers more than once. So because this first event doesn't affect any of the other events, this would be considered an independent event. So again, you could choose any number zero through nine, meaning there are 10 possible numbers you could choose for the second number in your password and 10 possible numbers you could choose for the third number in your password and 10 possible numbers you could choose for the fourth number in your password. And the counting principle says to figure out the total number of possible combinations, all you have to do here is just multiply 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. And you get that there are 10,000 possible passwords you can choose using the numbers zero through nine if numbers can be used more than once. Now, before you box this up and call it a day, you need to actually answer the question. It says find the probability that someone could guess your password on the first attempt. And remember, probability is the ratio of the favorable outcomes over the number of total possible outcomes. The total possible outcomes we just found to be 10,000 and they only get one attempt, meaning they only get one permutation of these given numbers. So the probability that they guess your password correctly on the first attempt would be one out of 10,000. Now, example three says there are nine baseball players on a team. What is the probability that you guess the coach's lineup correctly on the first attempt? So again, we are determining probability and probability is the ratio of the favorable outcomes over the total number of possible outcomes. So the first thing we always do in these questions is we figure out the total number of possible outcomes. So how many possible outcomes are there? How many possible lineups can be formed with nine baseball players? So the way we do that is by using the counting principle. We're gonna figure out how many baseball players can be chosen for each particular spot in the lineup, then multiply all those spots together and that should give us the total number of possible lineups that can be formed. So again, there are nine spots spots in this lineup. In the first spot, how many different players can we choose from? Well, there are nine total players on the team, meaning there are nine possible players that can go in the first spot in our lineup. Now, something to note about a baseball lineup is that if a player is chosen to be in the first spot in the lineup, they cannot also hit in the second spot in the lineup, meaning our first choice is going to affect all subsequent choices, making this a dependent event. So if there are nine players that can go in that first spot, there's only eight players that can go in that second spot because one of the players is already chosen for the first spot. Now, again, because we've already chosen a player for the first spot and we've chosen a player for the second spot, there are only seven different players we could choose from to fill in that that third spot. And it's going to continue on like this because we've chosen a player for the first, second, and third spot. There's only six different players we can choose from for the fourth spot. And then in the fifth spot, there's only five different players we can choose from. And then in the sixth spot, there's only four different players you can choose from. Seventh spot, three different players. Eighth spot, two different players. Until in that last spot, all of the other eight players have already been chosen. So there's only one player left to fill that ninth spot.
Now to determine the total number of possible lineups that can be created, the counting principle just says we multiply 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And we end up getting that there are 362,880 possible lineups you can form using 9 baseball players. But remember, before you box this up and call it a day, you need to answer the question. It says, what is the probability that you guess the coach's lineup correctly on the first attempt? Well, remember, probability is the ratio of the favorable outcomes to the total number of possible outcomes. And in this case, the total number of possible outcomes would be 362,880. And how many favorable outcomes would there be then? Well, you only get one attempt. It has to be your first attempt. So you get one permutation of that baseball lineup, meaning the probability that you guess the coach's lineup correctly on the first attempt would be one out of 362,880. Hey, I just met you, and this is crazy, but I'm a pirate, so call me Métis. Ha <laughs> you try. Okay, this says there are seven Harry Potter books and you are randomly arranging them on your bookshelf. What is the probability that the books are arranged in chronological order? So again, we are determining probability and probability is the ratio of the favorable outcomes to the total number of possible outcomes. So in these problems, we are figuring out the total number of possible outcomes first. And the way we've been doing that is by using the counting principle. So what we need to do is we need to figure out how many different ways can we arrange these books on a shelf? Well, since there are seven books, there's going to be seven different spots to fill. In that first spot, how many different books can go in that first spot? Well, since we have seven books, there are seven different books that can go in that first spot. Now, the question is, how many different books can go in the second spot? Well, if you're already putting a book in the first spot, that book cannot also go in the second spot. So this is going to be a dependent event because your first choice affects all subsequent choices. So because whatever book you chose to be first can't also be second, there are only six different books to choose from for that second spot and in that third spot because you've already chosen a book to be in the first spot and the second spot there are only five different books to choose from for the third spot and then four books for the fourth spot and then three books for the fifth spot two books for the sixth spot and then one book for that seventh spot so to figure out the total number of possible arrangements of these seven books on a shelf the counting principle just says you take seven multiply it to six then multiply that to five four three two and one and you end up getting that there are five thousand and forty possible arrangements of those seven books books on a shelf. Now again, before you box this up and call it a day, you need to actually answer the question. It says, what is the probability the books are arranged in chronological order? Now, chronological order just means the order in which they were released, the first book to the last book in that specific order. Because we're finding probability, remember probability is the ratio of the favorable outcomes to the total number of possible outcomes. And we just figured out the total number of possible outcomes. That would be 5,040. That's how many different ways you could arrange those seven books on a shelf. So that number is going to go in our denominator. Well, how many favorable outcomes are there? Well, that would be arranging your book in chronological order on that first try. And there's only one way to arrange it in chronological order. So the probability that if you are randomly arranging the books on a shelf and you happen to get the chronological order of those books would be one out of 5,040. Now let's talk about permutations with repetitions. So the number of permutations of n objects of which p are alike and q are alike is n factorial over p factorial times q factorial. Now what we have been doing is we've been using the counting principle to determine how many different ways you can arrange a group of things of which none of those things are the exact same. They're all different things. This formula right here is going to help us figure out how many different ways you can arrange a group of things of which some of those things are the exact same. So let me show you how this works. Example four says, how many different ways can you arrange the letters of the word benzene? Now the counting principle would just say you take the total number of letters and then you multiply how many numbers can go in the first spot by how many numbers can go in the second spot by how many numbers can go in the third spot and so on. But here's the issue. There are three different E's and two different N's. And let's say you switch this E and this E. That doesn't count as a different arrangement. These are still the same exact letter. So there are letters that repeat in this group of letters. Therefore, we have to use the permutations with repetitions formula. So the way you use the permutations with repetitions formula is you first figure out how many total things are there. So in this case, how many total letters are there in benzene? Well, there would be seven total letters. Next, we need to figure out which letters repeat and how many times do they repeat. So the letter E repeats three times and the letter N repeats two times. Lastly, we can then use the permutations with repetitions formula. That would be N factorial over P factorial times Q factorial. Now, N would be the total number of letters in the word benzene. That's seven. That's going to go in there. 
P is going to be how many times does one of the letters repeat? Well, let's look at E. E repeats three times. So we're going to put three in for P. Q would be how many times does another letter repeat? So let's look at N. N repeats two times. So two is going to go in for Q. Now all we have to do is just evaluate this. So remember, seven factorial is just seven times all of the natural numbers less than seven. Three factorial is just three times all the natural numbers less than three. And two factorial is two times all the natural numbers less than two. So is there anything we can cancel out here? Yeah, the threes cancel out, the twos cancel out, and the ones cancel out. And we end up getting seven times six times five times four over two times one, which is just 840 over two, which simplifies to 420. Now, what does this mean? What did we just find? Well, this means that there are 420 possible ways to arrange the letters of the word benzene. Why don't you ever see a pirate cry? Because they have privateers. Ha <laughs> ha, you try. Okay, doing the same thing. Part A, we have Nick, and Nick has five pennies, three nickels, and four dimes. The coins of each denomination are indistinguishable. How many ways can he arrange them in a row? So, again, we have a group of things, and some of those things repeat. So, in order to figure out how many different ways we can arrange those things, we're going to use the permutations with repetitions formula. The first step in that would be to figure out how many total things are there. In this case, how many total coins do we have? Well, there are five pennies, three nickels, and four dimes, so five plus three plus four, that's going to give you 12 total coins. Next, we need to figure out which coins repeat and how many times do they repeat. Well, we know there are five pennies, three nickels, and four dimes. Now, with this knowledge, we can use the permutations with repetitions formula. So if you recall, the permutations with repetitions formula is n factorial over p factorial times q factorial. Except in this case, we have three different things that repeat. So we're just going to add another letter with a factorial on it. So it would be n factorial over p factorial times q factorial times r factorial. And you just add however many you need based on how many different things repeat in your total group. So let's plug in what we know. We know there are 12 total coins, so 12 is going to go in for N. We know that there are five pennies that are indistinguishable, so five we're going to plug in for P. We know that there are three nickels, and the nickels are indistinguishable, so we're going to plug in three for Q. And there are four dimes, and the dimes are indistinguishable, so we're going to plug in four for R. Now all we have to do is just simplify this out. Remember, 12 factorial is just 12 times all the natural numbers that are less than 12. 5 factorial is 5 times all the natural numbers that are less than 5. 3 factorial is 3 times all the natural numbers less than 3. 4 factorial, 4 times all the natural numbers less than 4. Now all we have to do is just cancel out whatever we can cancel out. The 5s cancel out, the 4s, 3s, 2s, and 1s cancel out. And we're left with 12 times 11 times 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 in our numerator, which is 3,991,680. In our denominator, 3 times 2 times 1 times times four times three times two times one, that's 144. We then divide 3,991,680 by 144, and we get 27,720. Now, don't just leave this as your answer. What did we just find? We found that there are 27,720 possible ways to arrange these coins in a row. Part B, this time it says, how many different ways can you arrange the letters of the word Mississippi? So we, again, have a group of letters, a group of things, and some of those things repeat. We have multiple I's, multiple S's, and multiple P's. So in order to figure out how many different ways we can arrange this group of letters, we need to use the permutations with repetitions formula. And the first step in that formula is figuring out how many total things do we have? How many total letters do we have in this case? Well, looking at Mississippi, there are 11 total letters in the word Mississippi. Next, step two, we need to figure out which letters repeat and how many times do they repeat? Well, as you can see, there are four I's in Mississippi, there are four S's in Mississippi, and there are two P's in Mississippi. Now what we need to do to figure out how many different ways we can arrange the letters in the word Mississippi is use the permutations with repetitions formula, n factorial over p factorial times q factorial. But again, this time we have three different things that repeat, meaning it's not just going to be n factorial over p factorial times q factorial, it's going to be n factorial over p factorial times q factorial times r factorial. So now we're going to take 11, plug that in for our n, that's our total number of letters. Now how many times does i repeat? That will be 4, we can plug that in for p. How many times does s repeat? That would be 4, we can plug that in for q. How many times does p repeat? That would be 2. We can plug that in for r. Now what we have to do is just expand this. 11 factorial is just 11 times all the natural numbers less than 11. 4 factorial is just 4 times all the natural numbers less than 4. 4 factorial is just 4 times all the natural numbers less than 4, and then 2 factorial is just 2 times all the natural numbers less than 2. So now we just cancel out whatever we can cancel out. The 4s cancel out, the 3s cancel out, the 2s cancel out, and the 1s cancel out, and we end up getting that this is equal to 1,663,200 over 48. When we divide that, we end up getting 34,650. Now what did we just find? We found that there are 34,650 possible ways to arrange the letters of the word Mississippi. Now let's quickly talk about circular permutations. So if n distinct objects are arranged in a circle, then the number of permutations of the objects around that circle is n minus 1 factorial. 
Now, the reason this is different is because when you're arranging objects around a circle, there's no starting spot and ending spot. They're just all around the circle. And because of this, the amount of different ways you can arrange n objects around a circle is actually decreased by a factor of however many objects there are in the first place, which is why to find the number of permutations of the objects around a circle, you use the formula, the quantity n minus 1 factorial. Now example 5 says 5 people sit around a round table. How many different seating arrangements are possible? Well again, we are arranging objects around a circle. Because of that, we need to use the circular permutations formula, n minus 1 factorial, where n is the total number of objects, in this case the total number of people. And since there are 5 people, we plug in 5 for n, and now we can evaluate this. 5 minus 1 is going to give you 4, and then 4 factorial is just 4 times all the natural numbers less than 4. 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which equals 24, meaning that there are 20 24 possible seating arrangements of these five people around a circular table. How did the pirate do on the golf course? He hit par! You try! Okay, this says there were 13 knights of the round table. What is the probability that they sat in the specific order seen below? So, this time we are figuring out probability. And remember, probability is the ratio of the favorable outcomes over the total number of possible outcomes. So, the first thing we need to find is the total number of possible outcomes. So, how many possible outcomes are there for 13 knights sitting around a round table? Well, we need to use the circular permutations formula again, n minus 1 factorial. And in this case, there are 13 knights. So, we take 13, plug that in for n. That's our total number of objects. We then subtract 13 and 1 and we get 12. Then 12 factorial we evaluate just by taking 12 and multiplying it by every natural number less than 12. And we end up getting 12 factorial is equal to 479,000,600. That would be the total number of possible seating arrangements of the 13 knights around the round table. Now the question is, what is the probability that they sat in this specific order? Well remember, probability is just the ratio of the favorable outcomes over the total number of possible outcomes. We just found the total number of possible outcomes. That's going to go into our denominator. Well, in this specific order, we know that there's only one chance that that happens, meaning the probability that these 13 knights sat in this specific order around the round table would be 1 out of 479,000,600.